events such as these sometimes result in loss of life, but frequently they result in significant damage to the marine environment. The cost of environmental damage these days can run into billions, and for all the parties involved, damage to reputation that may never be recovered. Not without reason, then, does the shipping community make prevention of oil spills a high priority. And that means recognizing all the potential causes of oil spills, including poor navigation, inadequate voyage planning, stress and fatigue. It means being vigilant during cargo operations or when bunkering is taking place. It means having clear systems and procedures with which everyone is familiar. The basic requirements for the prevention and reaction to marine oil spills, along with other dangerous substances, are contained within international regulations. In this program, we're going to consider the requirements under the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, MARPOL. As part of the pollution prevention framework of MARPOL, every ship greater than 400 gross tons and every oil tanker larger than 150 gross tons is required to have a shipboard oil pollution emergency plan, a SOPEP. Tankers carrying noxious liquid substances are subject to a similar requirement under MARPOL. In most parts of the world, the SOPEP will govern the response to oil and bunker spills. MARPOL prohibits any discharge of oil other than very small quantities under carefully controlled conditions. Everything possible must be done to avoid a spill. Most spills from ships are small, less than seven tons or 50 barrels. Most of these occur during routine cargo operations and bunkering. These are controlled events, so with good planning and strict adherence to proper procedures, the risk of spills can be reduced. Should there be an incident, minimizing the spill will depend on a rapid response from the deck watch and good communications. Let's consider bunkering in particular. The first step in bunkering is a written plan. A bunkering operation should be treated with the same care as a cargo operation. Follow the procedures and checklists set out in your ship's manuals. All officers and crew who will be involved must be briefed and have access to the plan. Nothing should be overlooked. Concurrent activities, such as cargo operations or tank transfers, for example. A sudden change in the ship's trim during the bunkering operation could be disastrous. Well, when will we start bunkering? The piping system must be correctly lined up, and all bunker system valves and connections not required must be closed. If there are any sea or overboard valves connected to the bunker system, they must be closed and lashed. The ship should ensure that barge or shore personnel have checked that the hoses are in good condition. All scuppers must be plugged, including drain holes in drip trays. The drip trays themselves must be placed below all connections and air vents. The vents must be opened so that the displaced air can escape freely. Only approved sorbent materials may be used, and these, along with portable pumps, must be made ready. If this equipment is already on deck to safeguard cargo operations, some of it may need to be moved, but only with the knowledge and agreement of those running the cargo operation. Sand and sawdust are effective sorbents, provided they are ready to hand and available in sufficient quantity. 
and simple hand pumps are an effective means of removing water from small amounts of spilled oil. Before bunkering begins, there must be a meeting between the ship's staff and the bunker barge staff. The bunkering plan must be discussed. The units of measurement and rates of flow must be understood by everybody. There needs to be agreement about procedures for both emergency shutting down and topping off. And there must be complete agreement over communications. The checklist must be discussed and signed off only when all items have been completed. Only once everything is agreed and the ship has checked the bunker tanks can the connections be made and checked. When everything is secure, bunkering can begin. Pipe connected, bulb open, ready to receive bunker, sir. Thank you, Bosun. Chief Arabea, Chief Engineer of the Bridge, we are ready to start bunkering. The officer in charge gives the order to commence once he is certain that all the valves to the designated tanks are open. The transfer must start at a low flow rate. Everyone must be aware that things can go wrong at any time, and they should be prepared for the worst possibility. A vigilant deck watch is essential. There must be continual checking of all pipework and air vents for oil leaks. Transfer rates will need to be carefully monitored and kept to the figures set out in the plan to ensure there is no overpressurization of tanks. Communication between ship and bunker operators should be continuous, preferably by visual, voice and radio contact. Oil coming through now. Communications are vital. Most bunkering spills are caused or made worse by a failure in the communications between the ship and the bunkering personnel. Ample ullage space must be left for draining the hoses. Everyone must keep alert and be ready to stop the procedure immediately there is any sign of a leak. The quicker the pressure is reduced, the smaller the spill. Transfer operations during rain require extra monitoring of the deck containment system. With scuppers plugged, the deck can fill with water, enabling any spillage to overflow quickly over the side. Should there be a bunker spill or likelihood of a spill, the SOPEP will come into action and possibly the terminal's response plan. Every effort must be made to contain the oil on the ship. The plan will list specific tasks for many. Others, including everyone who can be spared from other duties, should be ready to help. In an uneventful bunkering operation, once topping off is complete, the disconnection procedure can begin. Bunker's finished. All hoses must be drained before disconnection particularly important since large hoses could contain several tons of oil. All system connections must be blank flanged as soon as the hose is disconnected. All fuel lines and tank filling valves must be securely closed. Final ullaging should be done to confirm the quantity received and that ample space has been left for expansion. Good planning, thorough checking of equipment and keeping to the correct procedures will reduce the chance of an operational spill in both bunkering and cargo operations. However, ship's officers all need to be fully conversant with their ship's response plan. We've also finished the pre-arrival checklist for port. The Marpole SOPEP will have five sections. General information about the ship, a list of reporting requirements in the event of a spill, 
steps to be taken to control any discharge of oil, a list of national and local coordination centres, together with procedures for coordinating response actions with shore-based organisations, and lastly, additional information about training and review procedures and other topics. This information may not be set out in five distinct sections in your ship's SOPEP, but all the details will be there, as well as a great deal of more specific information about each topic. The plan will be an action checklist. It is specific to each ship and includes the list of mandatory notifications which must be made in case of a spill or even if a spill is likely. Regular exercising of emergency plans is mandatory under MARPOL and the ISM code. Sometimes these exercises are organized on a national scale and may well involve several vessels, port authorities and spill cleanup operators. Exercises are often organized by head office to test the safety management system and also by the master. Whoever initiates the exercise, it is important that planning is carried out with a specific training objective. In this instance, it has been decided to exercise the communications between the ship and shore in response to a serious incident, a grounding. This ship is an oil tanker, but a similar exercise simulating a bunker spill after a grounding would be useful for any ship with a Marple SOPEP. The master plans the exercise scenario well in advance with the help of his chief officer. Um, what's the vessel's draft at the moment? As the exercise will be carried out while the ship is at anchor, this includes preparing a chart of the ship's position at the time of the hypothetical incident. Tide and weather conditions are also decided. To keep the exercise vigorous, it's important to work out a different, realistic and interesting scenario each time. As the exercise is primarily a communications exercise, the master informs his marine superintendent of when it is likely to start, making absolutely clear that it is a drill. I understand that you will start the exercise. They agree a mutually acceptable time. Neither of them informs his staff of the precise details, but everyone is made aware that a drill is imminent. At an appropriate moment in the ship's operations, the master starts the exercise. How much realism is possible will depend on the ship's operations. The master begins by informing the engine room. In a real grounding, the master would instruct the engine room to stop the engine. In a genuine emergency, it would be necessary to stop the air supply fans. This is to avoid the risk of flammable vapors from any oil discharge reaching the engine room and accommodation spaces. Depending on the circumstances, oil could get in through seawater intakes. Mate, Captain. Yeah, good morning. We're going to start the drill that we discussed yesterday. In an emergency, one of the first steps would be to muster the crew. In this exercise, the master informs only those who need to know. As the objective is primarily to test communications, only the key players are mustered. The master and another officer will remain on the bridge. The emergency party, who in a real incident would probably be on deck, will be in the cargo control room. Another officer, who will represent the Coast Guard, establishes himself in a cabin. He also has a chart of the sea area of the simulated grounding. For reference, the master gets out the oil pollution emergency plan. Hello, second. Hello, third mate. Yes, sir. Captain has decided to have a drill today. It's regarding oil pollution. From the ship's cargo control room, the emergency party, generally with the chief officer in charge, will notify the master of the exercise events on deck. So anyway, we... Mate, Captain. 
Coming, sir. Can you give me your preliminary report on... The master uses his walkie-talkie to communicate with him. Uh, well, on deck I could find out that the oil level in number three starboard tank is falling down. According to the incident scenario, oil can be seen on the water by the starboard bow. At least one tank has been ruptured. There's no casualty at present, then I don't think there's any obvious danger at present. Again, making clear that the ship is in a drill situation, the master begins the initial notification of the shore-based organizations, starting with the nearest coastal state, represented by the officer seen earlier. This is Milford Coast Guard. What's the name of your ship, please? Notification of the coastal state is mandatory under Marpole if there is an actual or probable discharge of oil. The authorities will want accurate and up-to-date information to enable them to consider their own response. Charlie 6 Kilo Alpha 3, this is Milford Coast Guard. Your message received, understood. Back to Next to be notified are the operators or owners. With both them and the coastal authorities, the master sets up a schedule of communications. In this way, everyone will know when they will get an information update. I understand that you are aground and the number three tank is definitely ruptured. I'll get back to you as soon as we've got any further information. It is probably best for the master to stay on the bridge okay. throughout the exercise, as that is where he would need to be during any incident. It is from there that he can most effectively coordinate the activities of everyone involved in the response. Mate, Captain? Point there. Right, can you give me the latest update on deck? Yes, sir. After checking, I find that there is no To get information about the events on deck, he talks to the chief officer. Yes. Um, what about soundings around the ship? So I've sounded the areas around the ship and it appears that the vessel is aground. It is from the bridge that the master can best talk to the shore-based authorities when he needs to. Would it be possible to The safety of his crew and his ship three, will always be his two, prime concern. Tank, you think? Uh, well, I checked the chief officer informs him that soundings indicate that only a small portion of the ship's bottom is in contact with the seabed. Alleging indicates that the starboard number three wing tank has leaked a substantial quantity of heavy fuel oil. It is possible that a second tank is leaking slowly. So we're only aground around uh, starboard side forward of number three. Now that the type and quantity of oil spilt is known, the master notifies the coastal state and the owner of the precise details of the incident. The plan will have a contact list as well as a list of the information that will be required. Many of the items are obvious, but under the stress of an emergency, even the obvious can be forgotten. Yes, good morning. Can I speak to the Marine Superintendent again, Mr. Captain of the Francis? Marine Superintendent here. Good Go communications ahead, are vital in any response to a spill. And this doesn't just mean those on the ship. Those on shore have an important role to play in helping those at sea. They will have their own plan, which will be integrated with the ship's plan. As well as organizing the cleanup operation, they can take much of the burden of notification from the master, such as informing the P&I club, who may mobilize experts to the scene. Both the team on shore and those on the bridge should keep a timed record of the information they receive and their decisions and commands. This information will be very important should there be any legal proceedings afterwards. Charts with any notes or plots, as well as cargo arrangements and other relevant paperwork, must all be kept. Well, we know we are ground right from number three tank forward of it. The SOPEP will list a number of possible methods of reducing pollution. These will include transferring the cargo between tanks, lightering, and so on. These arrangements would also be applicable to a bunker spill. Permission will need to be given by the shore authorities for any procedure that involves transferring cargo or moving the ship. 
Will you look into the possibility, see if we can transfer cargo from number two and number three, starboard two? And if everyone on board is safe, then reducing the quantity of oil reaching the environment has the highest priority. In this scenario, there is a slow leak from a second tank. If the oil from this tank, as well as the oil remaining in the ruptured tank, can be transferred, the amount of pollution will be reduced. Whilst references to the ship's loading computer may still be made, a grounding or any damage to the hull will affect the structural stresses on the ship and may invalidate the data. This will make it impossible for those on board to evaluate accurately the consequences of any transfer of cargo or bunkers. The master will need advice from his shore office as only they will have the expertise and data necessary to make a reliable assessment, sometimes by using an outside stability consultant or by referring to the classification society. But on, on the face of it, it seems that the ship was fully loaded and... Uh, this technical assistance is one of the many things that the shore office can do to help those on the stricken ship. The shore team should regard themselves as an integral part of the ship's oil spill response. Apart from seeking specific technical advice, should it be needed, the team has ready access to specialist organizations, such as OCIMF, the oil company's International Marine Forum, and ITOPF, the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation. Media and press interest is liable to be intense. Ideally, media response should be coordinated on shore. Press briefings should be regular and as full and accurate as the circumstances allow. Hello, press officer. There are no reported casualties. Never speculate. Keep to the facts. If information is not fed to the press, they are liable to draw their own conclusions. Yes, Coast Guard, Charlie 6, Kilo Alpha 3. I have an update report on a message of uh, an hour ago. I can confirm that we, the vessel is aground and the draft has been reduced by approximately one meter, so we are one meter aground forward and at the moment we have lost approximately 120 cubic meters. Although by now the coastal state authorities will have activated their plan and appointed a clean-up contractor to contain the pollution, they need to be kept up to date on what is happening on the ship. Right, I think that's the, their answer. 200 tonnes from each of those tanks into six centre. Um, and you reckon... Transferring the cargo, in this case, or indeed bunkers, okay. from a leaking tank would reduce the risk of further pollution. A transfer may also be necessary to refloat the vessel. But is this practical without endangering the ship? Can I speak to the Marine Superintendent again, please? Thanks. The operator's office is now asked whether it would be safe to transfer the cargo. The naval architect, who has been called in to assist in the exercise, examines the problem. Yeah. view that doing this will not endanger the ship, so you may go ahead with the transfer. As only a small part of the ship's bottom is aground, the indications are that it would be safe to proceed. This will entail mixing some cargoes. In these circumstances, cargo quality concerns are secondary. It is more important to reduce the risk of pollution. So about 20 minutes before you're ready to start uh, moving the cargo. Get right to it. Right, second mate, uh, what's the tide doing now? OK, Captain, let's see. Examination of the exercise charts shows the ship aground on a sandy seabed with rock outcrops. Tidal considerations indicate it is likely that the ship will float off on the high tide expected in four hours. I reckon we should be finished in about For reasons of safety, quarters. it is decided to have tugs in attendance. Okay, we the situation is discussed and agreement time. sought from both the operator and the coastal state. Okay, so tugs will arrive. As the ship is not in peril, it is decided that the operator will organize the tugs. In about one hour's time, that's fine. 
I calculate that we sh would be floating off in about two hours' time. Call me back before then, please, Captain. Okay, bye-bye. Milford Coast Guard, Milford Coast Guard, Milford Coast Guard, this is Francis. Throughout the incident, the coastal state is kept informed of what the ship intends to do. In a real incident, they have the legal authority to direct the ship's movements. I've spoken to the owners and they are arranging tugs and would anticipate that the vessel will float off with assistance. The master decides to finish the exercise as its main objectives have been achieved. The ship returns to her normal operational footing. Engine room? Yes, second. Captain here, just phoning up to say that we have now completed this morning's exercise. OK, thank you. Good morning, Captain of the Francis. Uh, can I speak to the super again, please? Hello again, Captain. Just phoning up to say that we've now completed the exercise. I think it's gone very well. And, of course, I'll be sending in a re full report uh, with any recommendations. You should get that in the next two or three days. Soon afterwards, okay, bye -bye. there is a formal debriefing. This is as important as the exercise itself, since all aspects of the response must be analysed, any shortcomings identified, and improvements to the effectiveness of the plan put into action. Exercises should be logged, and available for inspection as evidence by port state control inspectors. We'll never have oil spills. We won't have accidents. Cargo and bunker spills are not common, but they still occur in spite of every effort to prevent them. The objective of the MARPOL Convention is to eliminate marine oil pollution. To this end, ships are required to have an international oil pollution prevention certificate and ships above a defined size are required to have an oil record book and a ship's oil pollution emergency plan, a SOPEP. There is no substitute for good training. That is why it is so important to exercise the SOPEP. These exercises should be as familiar to ship's officers and crew as lifeboat and fire drills, whether their ship's cargo is oil or not. Oil spills can have serious consequences for the environment, the ship's operator, the cargo owner, and the seafarer. So make sure.